This is Gunib. It is the place where Imam Shamil mounted his final stand against the onslaught of the expanding Russian Empire. And looking at this landscape, one thing is clear. The Russians paid dearly to take it. And same goes for every other village, hill and settlement in Dagestan. For this is a rugged mountainous landscape of Khabibs. Breathtaking in its scenery and possessing an incomprehensibly dense history and culture of the various people who inhabit these lands and kick ass. So, why is the Republic of Dagestan like nowhere else in Russia? Why did it take almost 50 years to conquer these lands? What are the challenges facing modern Dagestan? And what's with this crazy hat? Let's roll. The Republic of Dagestan is situated in the North Caucasus of Eastern Europe, along the Caspian Sea. As the southernmost tip of Russia, the Republic shares land borders with the countries of Azerbaijan and Georgia to its south and southwest. The Republic covers an area of 50,300 square kilometers. So it's just a little bigger than the country of Slovakia. But it has a population of over 3.1 million. So that means there are more people living here than in all of Krasnoyarsk Krai, which is about 46 times bigger. That isn't very surprising to be honest. But what is surprising is that Dagestan has 14 official languages and more than 30 are commonly spoken. This is because there are about 30 ethnic groups and 81 nationalities, most of whom speak either Caucasian, Turkic or Iranian languages. Prior to the breakup of the USSR, the proportion of Russians was as high as 10%, but once given the opportunity to leave, they did. Now ethnic Russians make up just some 3.6%. The word Dagestan is of Turkish and Persian origin, directly translating to the land of the mountains. The ruggedness of the terrain has over centuries created countless cultures, peoples and dialects in a relatively small area. The only thing the people mostly agree on today is religion. According to survey, 83% of the population adheres to Islam and only some 24 to Russian Orthodox, while a whole 9% of the population regards themselves as spiritual but not religious. All of these things combined create a challenge for Russia, which it must manage. The strategic importance of Dagestan to Russia is clear. It's the largest republic in the North Caucasus in terms of size and population. Makhachkala, the republic's capital, is Russia's only year-round warm water port on the Caspian. Even more important, at least in the minds of many Moscow officials, is the oil pipeline passing through Dagestan, bringing Caspian oil from Baku to the Russian port of Novorossiysk for export to foreign markets. Dagestan certainly is an important part of Russia, and Russian is the default language, but culturally speaking, it doesn't feel like it. To see what I mean, let's visit some of the most spectacular locations. With historical documentation dating to the 8th century BC, Durbant is one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. Due to its strategic location, over the course of history, the city changed ownership many times amongst the Persians, Arab, Mongol, Timurid, and Shirvan kingdoms. In the 19th century, the city passed from Persian into Russian hands by the Treaty of Gulistan of 1813. It was the first of a series of treaties signed between Iran and Imperial Russia. By 1828, after two major wars, Iran gave up possession of all its Caucasian territories. And so thereafter, Russians were free to take over. Going back further, Derbent's location on a narrow 3 km strip of land between the Caspian Sea and the Caucasus Mountains allowed its rulers to control land traffic between the Eurasian steppe and the Middle East. The only other practicable crossing of the Caucasian Ridge was over the Daryal Gorge. As a result, an ancient fortress was built there by the Persian Sasanian Empire to protect the eastern passage of the Caucasus Mountains against the attacks of the nomadic peoples coming from the north. This is Old Gore. 
once a fortified mountain village. It was inhabited by seven families who built seven battle towers. The time of construction of these towers dates back to the 16th and 17th century. But the residents decided to move lower, abandoning old gore. Farming and cattle breeding in the valley was much easier than at the top of the mountain. Some of the houses and towers in Old Gore were dismantled by people in order to build houses in a new place. Only four towers out of seven have survived to this day. In the central part of Dagestan, you will find the Sulak Canyon. It is 53 kilometers long and deeper than the Grand Canyon in Nevada to 1920 meters. This makes it by far the deepest canyon in Europe. Within this natural site, sediments of the Cretaceous, Jurassic and Tertiary periods come to the surface in each of which ancient fossils are found. And this is one of the oldest settlements of the territory of the Republic. Gamsutl is a picturesque Avar village. We don't know much about how this village was founded or when, but the place for the fortress was not chosen by chance, as the village is located about 1,500 meters above sea level, surrounded by cliffs and steep slopes. There used to be shops, a school, a post office, and multiple hospitals. However, over time, more and more people began to leave the village. Nothing crazy had happened. People simply left for a better life to study or work in towns or larger villages. The number of inhabitants fell to 200 in 1970. In 2015, the village's last resident died. He called himself mayor and became quite famous after a series of TV appearances. Today, it's only visited by tourists and wandering cows. Not far from Kamsutl is the village of Choch. In 1742, during the Andalal battle, it was here that the Highlanders inflicted a decisive defeat on the army of the Iranian ruler Nadir Shah, who during his Caucasus campaign tried to gain control of Dagestan. And during the Caucasian War, as the Russian Empire attempted to subjugate the mountain lands, Choch became the site of many battles as the mountain people fought for their independence. Now that we have together visited the landscapes of Dagestan, it's likely becoming apparent. The challenge at hand faced by those Russians who were looking to conquer these lands. It was only around 1800 that Russia was in a position to really push soldiers into the Caucasus region. A slow and steady expansion of its population from Muscovy meant that it was no longer overextended. In addition to this, Turkish and Persian powers were weakening, giving Russians an opening. While the people of the Caucasus mostly failed to work together to stop the advance, there was a challenge from what came to be known as the Caucasian Imamate, established by the Imams of Dagestan and Chechnya. An Imam is an Islamic leadership title. Essentially, it was religion which united this new state in its opposition to the Russians. With their great victory over Napoleon's Grand Army in 1812, the Russian people saw little concern in the petty Asiatic resistance occurring on their southern borders. But this changed in 1832 when the Caucasians launched an attack on Vladikavkaz. The Russians countered with an assault on the de facto capital of the Imamate, the small settlement of Gimri. This resulted in the seizure of the town by the Russians and the death of its first Imam leader. But this gave opportunity. The legendary Imam Shamil was present during the Russian assault on Gimri, and the story told was that he was one of the few to survive due to his incredible fighting skills. Landing behind them, whirling his sword in his left hand, he cut down three of them, but was bayoneted by the fourth, the steel plunging deep in his chest. He seized the bayonet, pulled it out of his flesh, cut down the man, and with another superhuman leap, cleared the wall and vanished in the darkness. When the second Imam was murdered in 1834, Shamil took his place as the prime leader, uniting the many quarrelsome Caucasian tribes to fight against the Russians by the force of his charisma, piety and fairness in applying Sharia law. And he believed the Russian introduction of alcohol corrupted traditional values. 
Shamil hoped that Britain, France or the Ottoman Empire would come to his aid to drive Russia from the Caucasus. These plans never came to fruition and after the Crimean War, Russia was free to redouble its efforts against him. Shamil's last stand was at Gunib in August of 1859. After 25 years of guerrilla fighting and resistance, Russia had finally managed to conquer Chechnya and Dagestan in a series of bloody conquests. Tsar Alexander II of Russia openly admired Shamil's resistance. So after capture, Shamil received good treatment. He was eventually allowed to perform the Hajj, a spiritual pilgrimage to the Mecca. He died shortly after performing it in 1871. And today people make a connection between Shamil and the renowned UFC fighter Khabib. The official story is that the UFC fighter's great-grandfather was one of the highest ranking officers in the Imam's army. This illuminates how Khabib's heritage traces back to a time of great Muslim oppression. And it also explains why Khabib wears the papapka. It is a callback to his heritage and a sign of pride and resistance against overwhelming odds in the name of Islam. As they say in the Caucasus, a man should carry about two things, a papapka and a name. Dagestan has a lot of potential, especially with regards to tourism, and it also has a fair share of natural resources. However, it is being held back and is economically behind the rest of Russia. Governments still issue warnings, stating that travel to Dagestan is unsafe due to political instability, criminal activity, bombings, Islamist terrorist attacks, and crime. This is not without good reason. Moscow officials have long been concerned about the spread of Wahhabism, a strict form of Islam that insists on a literal interpretation of the Quran, which is said to be spreading with support from militant Islamic groups abroad, including Afghanistan, Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. But the main problem so far has arisen from Dagestan's neighbors. The region first captured world attention in early 1996 in the midst of the first post-Soviet war in Chechnya when a major hostage-taking incident took place in the town of Kizlar, where some 2,000 hostages were taken by about 200 Chechen guerrillas. The hostages were released after some negotiation, and the action moved to the town of Permovskoye, which was turned into a battlefield. The 90s were a tough time for Northern Caucasus. Bombings, assassinations, and hostage situations became common as the war in Chechnya spilled over. And radical Islam is still a major problem as many young men without purpose or career prospects seek an outlet. As a result, before the war in Ukraine, Dagestan topped the charts with regards to incidents of violence in the Russian Federation. Dagestan is also the most ethnically diverse of all the former Soviet autonomies, and many of its officially recognized nationalities have grievances with each other. Accordingly, there have been frequent predictions that Dagestan is on the verge of widespread inter-ethnic violence. Despite the destabilizing influence of the chaos in neighboring Chechnya, Dagestan has managed to avoid all-out anarchy. Surprisingly, it seems, ethnic diversity has given this republic better social cohesion. We can argue that because there is no dominant ethnic group, there are no oppressed people, unlike in other Russian republics. The people are more varied, but they have no choice but to be in it together. So no one group or autocratic leader is able to emerge to start creating unrest. Dagestan was also the poorest region in Russia during the Soviet period, and with the exception of war-torn Chechnya and Ingushetia, it currently remains the poorest of Russia's federal subjects. Corruption in Dagestan is more severe than in other regions of the former Soviet Union and is coupled with a flourishing black market and clan-based economic systems. 50 to 60 percent of economic activity in Dagestan lies in its shadow economy. Its unemployment rate is higher than Russia's other districts, especially affecting the young. Average earnings are lower and labor migration to Russia's interior higher. Moscow pledged to invest some $70 billion into the development of North Caucasus by 2025, but the materialization of this money is no longer realistic, since the fighting in Ukraine has only been intensifying. 
The military is one of the few options for the young men of the Caucasus, and they are eager to join. Not only is it considered the Khabib thing to do, it's also one of the only available means of economic mobility. In the past, federal quotas have put a limit on the number of soldiers who can come from each Russian region. But in March 2022, Dagestani draft offices began actively recruiting contract soldiers to serve in the special military operation in Ukraine. The salaries offered from 177,000 rubles, around $2,000 a month for a regular soldier, to 215,000 rubles, about 2.3,000 for an officer, while the average salary in the Republic is little over 32,000 rubles, or $377 and with an unemployment rate above 15%, just war or not, liberation or invasion. It seems to me these sorts of questions just don't matter in the face of economic realities. Dagestan is a land which is said to have settled down into a state of stable instability. The motivations which once led the people to fight for their freedom have not changed. This land is the wild south of Russia, and I would guess it would be one of the first to break away if a major destabilizing event were to occur. In this video, I did my best to avoid discussing all the empires and the dense history which is to be found in the shadows of Persian, Mongolian and Turkish empires. Watch my video on Samarkand to learn about these realms and the incredible fluidity of history of Central Asia. I would once again like to extend my gratitude to my Patreons.